By taking notes, it's, it gets you to memorize, it gets you to dwell on the subject matter. So when I went to school and studied under the ministry, I took notes, I recorded it with a little micro recorder so that I could take it home and digest it and study it because there was one thing I lacked and that was knowledge about my God. Now, I love God. I wanted to walk with them and be with them, but I lacked the knowledge to do such. And that's why God says, I put some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in the body of Christ for the perfecting of the body, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. So my job is to give you the how-tos and show yous and pray for you and encourage you to become a doer of the word. That's my job. One thing a pastor cannot do is we can't do it for you. Hello. You have to do it in your relationship with God. A couple of things I want to bring up. We have a sheet that we put out a long time ago, and that was the daily life check. How many know you need to keep your life in check? We can get out of sorts sometimes. So I put together something for the leaflet of your Bible called your daily life check. And it has things in there. It says, am I in the word daily? So you don't have to read a lot of the word, but you should read some daily. How many here take a medication for your daily life? Come on. Maybe vitamins. And yet if you, you, sometimes it's set up where if you miss some of those pills, you got to make up for it. Take the gospel every morning, just a little bit of the word, not a little pocket promise, but a little word so you can dwell on it. Why? The word of God is called a proverb. Everyone say proverb. You know what a proverb is? It's rule. It's a ruler. It's plumb, square. The word keeps us focused. So you want to start off in prayer and a little word every day so your day is focused. Who are you heading towards? God. Now here's where the problem comes. If you're heading to get the party done, God's not first. So you're going to have problems putting it together. But if you get up in the morning and you head to God, get a little word in you and say, Lord, I've got to do this party. I was asked to do it. Now you're going to let Jesus help you do it. And it's going to flow and you'll have plenty of time to enjoy it. Have you ever done something where you wish you wouldn't have, but it usually comes out all right? We're going to give you all the answers to that in our lesson today. In fact, good morning. Amen. Welcome to the briefing. Let me read something to you. Did you ever ask the question, how do I keep from stumbling? How about the one, truly, how do I keep from making bad choices in my life? I'm sure we've all asked that. We are God's children. How many here believe you're God's child? Yeah. Who lives in you? Yeah. All right. So if he lives in you, let me tell you, he knows where you are going. He in you knows where you're going. We might not have the idea. So rather than just trying to figure everything out, you get up, you meet with him, God starts sharing stuff, and you just head towards Jesus, head towards pleasing him, and everything you need to do, he would lengthen your days so you get those things done. And no stress, no mess. Everyone say no stress. No stress and no mess. If God orders our feet, shows us how to do it, when to do it, and what to do when we're there, there's no stress. There's no mess. Let me tell you a story. Can I give you a little testimony? The, the lesson is pretty short today, so I want to give you a little testimony. Years ago when God was training us younger Christians, can you imagine me being a young Christian? All fervor and no wisdom. <laughs> exactly. And so... But God began to do things with us. For one, he began to teach us how to follow the leading of the Spirit. How to listen to God when he says, do this, don't say this. Go ahead and operate this, but in two days from now. If you're going to get detail like this, and I'll explain why, it's going to take some training. God's going to have to train us to hear his voice properly, to know what he wants in our life. 
Can you say amen? How many know what he wants in our lives much better than what we want? Amen. And so back in the day, he would often, with, would always never be alone by me. I would have a friend. Now, I had a friend years ago, maybe, and I don't mind mentioning his name, his good brother. Uh, I haven't seen him in a while. I saw him about three years ago. He's a good brother, loves the Lord. His name was David. We'll leave the last name out. David was studying with me in the ministry. And I lived in a little chicken coop on Old Buckley Highway. And we would often sit in the field and discuss scripture. And we would do all this kind of thing. Well, one day he said, I want to show you. I got a new girlfriend, Pastor Gary. And so I said, I want to bring her over. Her name's Kathy. And so he brought her over and we took them out to eat. Now, while we were doing this, I'm going to make it short. God began to tell us to do certain things. Hello. And he said, stop and pray over this area. We said, okay. Now, I know this is going to sound a little strange, but it's not really strange. Think about all the Old Testament believers, how God says, go here, don't do that. And he guided them. We're not any different, but we're in a better testament. This is a new testament. We're not to be caught up in the world system, the social glitches of, of life. We're supposed to be following God. And following God's exciting, so let me tell you. So we stopped at three or four places, and God had me, David and myself get out. And when we would pray, the wind would pick up and move the trees. And it was just like he went, whoosh, and he cleansed the land. And we're going, wow, this is cool. And the ladies are in the car. They're going, what are these nuts up to, you know? So we got back home to my chicken coop, my house. And we had, we had stopped to eat a little earlier, and Kathy had started getting sick, deathly sick. And I said, well, what's wrong? You know, we had gone and done this. And she says, well, I'm kind of allergic to the Chinese food, the celery that's in the Chinese food. And I ate too much. She splurged. Well, she had a, a little condition where when she ate things like that, her kidneys would act up and she would be sick for two or three days. And she says, boy, Pastor Kerry, could you pray over me? And here's what I want to try to tell you. Sometimes we know that prayer is awesome. But you know, sometimes we need to know the timing of it, how to do when we pray, and what to do. And so with that, we need specific instructions. Can you say amen? So here's what happened. So I said, yep, I'm going to pray. And God said in my heart, sit back down in the couch. So we, two opposite couches. And God says, wait on me. So finally, after 10 minutes, she looks at me and says, are you going to pray or what? <laughs> I'm waiting on God's okay. Now I'm telling you this so that you can get a picture, okay? So finally, God says, okay, it's time. She got up, I got up, and I went to grab her hands. You know, reach out and grab hands and pray for... I like to pray for people and sometimes touch, grab their hands when you're praying, you know. You probably do that. And as soon as I grabbed her hands, now listen, the entire house disappeared. She disappeared and all I could see was her skeleton and two little demons hanging off her kidneys, sitting there like chipmunks. Now, did I ask for that to happen? No, but God has plans for his kids, when his kids meet up with him, and your life turns into a great adventure. Man, I have so many testimonies that I bore you for probably two months, just the testimonies. And you say, well, how do you do that? You walk with Jesus every day and let him know you're open. Whatever you want to do with me, God. You think God's done with us? He started with Moses when he was 80. Smile up at me. Say, I'm special. God made me special. Despite myself. You see, because maybe you had a bad morning. Does the morning, being bad or good, rule the effect that you receive from God? Is the morning greater than he? There you go. So in other words, God has to recondition our thinking. So I haven't, I'm just telling you a story. So when I prayed, I, come, I looked at those spirits. One thing about an evil spirit, they don't want you to see them. They don't want to be discovered. So I said, hey, I could see you. And they went, oh, leave us alone. 
and I could hear tandem. So I'd make a long story story. I commanded them bound. I commanded them to leave her body. They fell off and they backed out of my house. And then when I let go of her hands, you know what happened? She fell flat on the floor. Now the point I'm making is, sometimes we pray, but we just pray general things. Sometimes God wants us to get the specifics on how to. Okay, so that's what our lesson is on. Okay, so write this down if you can. The Bible gives us general guidance. You can read the Bible and get what to do, how to do it. You can see examples of people's faith. Come on, say amen. amen. But the Bible oftentimes doesn't address you specifically. And I'll tell you exactly what we need. We read our Bible, we get the general idea, but we have been given the Holy Spirit. Say Holy Spirit. His job is to teach us on the specifics. You're going to pray? Here's how I want you to pray. Don't touch them. Just speak to them. Did Jesus pray the same way every time? What was he being? He was being led by the Spirit on the general council of the world, how, uh, the word on how to do something specifically. One time he prayed for eyes. One time he spit on the ground made clay. And then he says something really funny, Linda. He says, the works that I do shall you do also. Just, give, just come on here and let me spit and make some clay. <laughs> Give me here. <laughs> Are you guys with me? Are you that serious? You can't see the fun in that? I can see Jesus, the creator of all things, spitting, making clay and saying, I'm going to turn this clay back into flesh. What is man made up of? Red clay. And God born man out of the dust of the earth or the red clay, called his name Adam, red clay. You're from the red clay. And he breathed the breath of life into him. All right, stick with me on this. Now, let me ask you, didn't Jesus say, pray that God lead you not into temptation? Didn't he say, Lord, deliver us from the evil one? God, every perfect gift, every Good gift comes from whom? Now, does God change? I want you to get these truths. Does God change? Does God ever change? He's forever the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he spoke it, he'll do it. If he promised it, he will bring it to what? Pass. Now, do you believe that? That's the key. If you have faith in that, the angels go to work to see that you get it. See, the angels are ministering spirits sent forth from heaven to earth to minister for those who are heirs of salvation. Here's the address, Hebrews 1.14. says that the angels are here to bring God's will to you and help you get it. Say amen. amen. I love what Hebrews says. You know what Hebrews says? Over in the 13th chapter, be careful how you address someone because some people address angels and they don't even know that they are unawares. Okay, you haven't lost me, so go back to what I said. The Bible is the general guidance how God guides us. In the Old Testament, we have people looking towards the coming of Messiah. In the New Testament, we look forward to walking with the Messiah. Can you say amen? Or Jesus Christ. So in the Old Testament, we can learn from their mistakes and some of their victories. But we can't practice the law because we've been redeemed from the law. The Ten Commandments were never written to a Gentile, and you're all Gentiles. That means that the Ten Commandments were written to the Jews because they were so full of themselves, they needed to look to God for their answers, not to the law. How many know when it says, thou shall not covet? The next time you're over in your neighbor's house and you see a lantern that you love, turn the other way. 
you see, that's how hard that was. Nobody was ever meant to follow the law. Listen, was never meant to follow the Ten Commandments. Never, but nobody. The only person that could was Jesus. Now think about it. If he fulfilled all the law and he canceled all the curse from the law and he says, come and live in me, because we have Jesus in us, we don't have to be concerned over the Ten Commandments because Jesus already fulfilled them. Amen. All we need to do is get up, walk with Jesus, and he will keep our feet straight and our path clear. Now, the key is doing that. Sometimes we forget to pray in the morning. Can you imagine that? I know sometimes I'll get up, I'll be doing other things, and oh, sorry, God. And after a while, it just becomes automatic. All right, say, say with me right here. How can we be guided by God? So let me give you some things. Write this down if you can. Number one, realize that God lives in you, so he guides you. Let him take control of your life. Folks, we're still in pretty much control of our life. And what I mean by that, not putting you down, is that before you even pray and ask God about it, you're doing it. And it doesn't come out good. And you go, God, how did that happen? He says, you could have stopped a minute and asked me. That's a heavy amen. So many people I've seen do things that have harmed them and hurt them, and all they needed to do is stop and pray and get God's mind on it. You got a neighbor who wants to move into your house? You better get God's mind on it. Come on. Someone wants to sell you a car? You better get God's mind on it. You understand how important that is? Oh, sure, it says for you to receive blessings generally, but God has specific ones just for you. They're all lined out for Chauncey and for Joe and for Carrie. You understand? Nobody else gets those. They're signed for you. You're his precious one. Remember, God doesn't treat us as a group per se. He treats us as an individual. Wonderfully and fearfully made. And he wants to relate to us on a one-to-one -one basis. Say amen. And the first time he starts doing that, you're going to feel very uncomfortable. God, I don't want you hanging around. All my friends are going to leave me. <laughs> Bye. I had lots of grass friends, you know, when I had a stash of grass. You know, I used to, I didn't deal, but I used to buy pounds of marijuana with my credit card. We write it off as jewelry, you know. And some of you might be able to relate. Really like. And so when we'd get a pound in, we'd make brownies, and of course, my house would be filled with all of my friends. Yeah. <laughs> we won't go very far on that, but I want to let you know the world will serve you lots of so-called goodies until you're hooked. And then Satan will rip it right out from under you. Hello. He'll promise you a rose garden, but he'll forget to tell you about the thorns. That's why we need to pray about our decisions. Say amen. So realize God's in you. So let him have control. Two, God placed a homing device when we got born again in every one of us. Say a homing device. In your phone, the new phones now has a tracker in it. Whether you shut your phone off or anything, there's a tracker in that phone. And it's there for your safety. Who knows what the Antichrist is going to do with it later on. You want to say, and when they advise you when you go up into the mountains... Go out into the woods and you're going to be gone for a couple of days. You take a, a beacon, a tracker for you. You follow what I'm saying? Well, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to understand God lives in you. He put a homing device in here with him. This device, now listen to me, runs and operates to constantly turn you around when you're headed in the wrong direction. And it turns you around and gets you headed back towards God. Everybody has one. 
Now, you might have a son, you might have a friend who's gone away from the Lord, and they're trying to run their own life, and their life is just a mess, and it's miserable. They're not listening to the homing device. And you've always heard me teach that if you're going to grow in the Lord, you have to let go of the control so God can help you. Why, Pastor Kerry? Because we have a human will, and if we want unwilling to let God have something. He cannot have it. So if you hold part of your life back and you give him a parcel of your life, now I'm just doing a happenstance here, then the parts that you don't give to God and subject to God are the parts that you're going to have the biggest trouble in. Satan always shoots holes in what you don't give God. You buy a new vehicle, put your hands on it, say, this is yours, Lord. Get a used vehicle. I got a prayer car over there. Amen. It runs in faith. Amen. And, and I have no complaints. We definitely got our $3,000 use out of it. Amen. It's wonderful. I just put my hands on it and say, God, make it run. Oh, Pastor Terry, you're just a religious fanatic. No, why am I getting the parking spot when you're driving around the parking lot? So if you want to learn, if you really, I'll spend time with you. I'll sit down and answer your questions. Don't overlook an opportunity for the word. Can you say amen? All right. Fourthly, excuse me. Thirdly, God says he will order our steps. Did you know that? He says, I'll order the steps of a righteous man. Because we have Jesus in us, that's how we're righteous. Not on our own. Because we have the righteous one in us. So he's going to order your steps if you listen. Say amen. So the word, fourth point, the word gives us a general instructions for life. But as it is written, the entrance of his word gives us light. But the Holy Spirit gives us specifics. We'll show you that in a minute. Sixthly, you and I are indwelt by God. We're individuals. We need specific instructions in our life by God to get it done. How many know we all have a little different language? Yes. People who are truck drivers, because we now Danny's a truck driver, we use that, and Ben back here, they have a language throughout the truck driving situation. <laughs> well, Christians have languages too. We have a language. For example, do you know what redemption means? That's part of your language. It means purchased. You're redeemed. So God purchased you. You're not your own, the Bible says. You belong to God. So if we're not our own, why are we making God's decisions for him? Smile up at me. We all do it. So the fun part of it is having you and God walking together as he shows our weaknesses to him and he laughs and he helps strengthen us and suddenly we, we become whole. We get yoked to God and God begins to teach us his way of walking and existing. And it is tremendously full of excitement. I mean, when the first day that I met Jesus, he blew my mind. I went as a skeptic to go to this Bible study. And God showed up. <laughs> Aren't you glad when God shows up? You brought him, and you brought him, and you brought him. And now we corporately gather together. When one or two or three are gathered in my name, one can put a thousand to flight, two can put, and then a compounding power. The more people we can get in here worshiping and getting under the word, the more power of God is resident. Can you say Amen. And then sixthly, so there must be a mixture. Now listen, here's the problem. Remember in school, remember they taught you about the dark ages? Do you know what caused the dark ages? Do you? They turned their backs on God and stopped printing the word. They took the Bible and put it into a Catholic monasteries and hid it from the public. When you hide the word from people, they don't see the light. And so Satan rolled in the dark ages, and you can see all kinds of plagues and everything. It's right there in history. Then, they, then came the Renaissance. Everyone say Renaissance. That's when they started printing the Bible again, and people could read it. Here's what I'm trying to say. 
the Holy Spirit needs the word to work with. The Holy Spirit doesn't make things work. He needs us as Christians to get in the word so the spirit can work with the word that is in us and we can evolve or be transformed into who we're supposed to be. Say amen. But the Holy Spirit, for young Christians, if we can't get you in the word, if we can't get you in the word, you're going to get reasoned with by God. And God will have to reason with you. How many here know that the reasoning facility is not always running good? You're thinking. Come on. So if we have the word, he brings us out of ourselves by the word of God. James chapter 1 verse 21. All right, listen to me now. Proverbs chapter 4, please go there. Look at verse 10 through 13. Proverbs chapter 4, 10 through 13. And again, every sermon that I do has outlines. So all, if you want an outline, you request for one, okay? Plus, I have a stack of outlines for you guys back there. <laughs> I dug them out today. All right, so, all right, so listen to what it says. Hear, my son, and receive my sayings. What? Did Jesus walk around always saying, those with the ears, let them what? Why is hearing so important? We're going to get to it. Hear, my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of your life will be many. Just told you. If you're not a listener, short life. Listeners get it. Amen? That's why people talking in church always kind of bugs me. You know? Let's go on. Not that you can't talk in church. All right. So listen. All right? And he says, I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in right paths. Now, if you want to know what kind of God wisdom he has, it's in James. Third chapter says the wisdom from above is this way. The wisdom that's from the earth is this way. Gives us a vision of our flesh, the way it operates, and our heart with God, the way it should operate. Can you say amen? The wisdom from above is first peaceable. Easy to be approached. You can correct it. People aren't so pridefully stubborn, you can't tell them a thing or two. How about those moms? How about those kids that are always telling you, I know, I know, and you know they have no clue. I have adults do that to me. <laughs> and I'm looking at them and it's like their shirt's on backwards and their tie's all crooked. I say, I know, I know. <laughs> all right, let's get on. All right, so listen to the rest of this. And when you walk, after you receive my sayings, your ears will increase. Okay? And you receive my wisdom. When you walk, your steps will be your steps will be not be hindered. And when you run, you shall not stumble. How many like that? You go to the doctor when you're older. What's the first thing they say to you? Have you stumbled? Did you fall today? What? Are you making a bet? <laughs> I have that thinking, you know. I used to be called a smart aleck, and I thank God I've been redeemed. But I have this thinking it's sharp and when somebody says dumb dumb I can pick up on it right away and I have to by the spirit keep saying anything all right so let's go on and it says I love it when you walk your steps you will not be hindered and when you run you will not stumble take firm hold of instructions do not let it go keep her she is your life. So the moment you stop learning, you die. And that's what happens to Christians. We get to a point where we, we got it down. And the next thing you know, you're crawling through the field somewhere and you're going, what happened? You took the glory away from God's helping us. Whenever we take the glory from God, then we get to eat our own glory or should I say garbage anyway let's move right on couple of points how to receive the best guidance as a Christian 
Number one, we need to be a humble listener. I'll write that down. Humble listener. Number two, there are two kinds of wisdom, a heavenly wisdom and an earthly wisdom. One is of the world and of the flesh. The other is of God and of the spirit. It's perfect. God's wisdom in you is perfect. Listen to it. Thirdly, God always leads us on the right path. So maybe you were told, well, God's allowing this in your life because you've been a bad person or because he wants to teach you something. That's a lie from hell. Why? God's living in you. Doesn't he know where he's going? We've taken these religious excuses and we moved them out of the Old Testament, put them in the new. Well, God's sending us through the mud and he's sending us through the flood and we're all going to have some crud. One pastor, I can't even tell you who he is because he's so well known, told me, and I told him he was wrong. He says, I'm either going into a problem, I just came from a problem, or I'm going to be in another problem here soon. I said, why aren't you coming from a blessing, going into a blessing, and you're going to receive a blessing soon? Why are you looking at half full glasses? Why are you staring at the world? What's one of the things that's our theme here? Eyes off the world. Eyes off of people. This election should have never affected you like it did. And eyes off yourself. You ask God to help work on that. And the rest will fall in order. Hello. When you get irritated, what happened? Your eyes saw a person say something you heard. Your eyes were on that person and they said something that offended you. If your eyes weren't on that, they could say something to you. It'd be like cursing at a little infant. The little infant... It's so cute, it's laying in the crib, and you go, man, you're ugly, and the little infant just pays no mind, just getting all caught up, and that's what the Bible says. When we do mischief, let us be as an innocent child and not get caught up in the entanglements of weird human behavior. See, good stuff, Pastor. Keep praying for me so I can keep giving you good stuff. All right, so now let's go on. So, we receive the best when we're humbly receiving and listening to God's word. Two, these are the two kinds of wisdom, heaven and earthly. And then three, God always leads us on the right path. Never the wrong path. Say amen. Because what could Satan accuse God of if he led us in the wrong path? Remember, Satan accuses God. Well, that person never did hear the gospel. They were down in Africa, way down by the bush. They've never had anybody preach the gospel to them. So guess what? You were unfair dealing with that person. And God says, no, I showed up at their death. And they made my, me their choice. See, God is never going to be accused of being unfair in anything. So you can rest assured God's going to always be perfect and fair concerning you. So you can rest in that. You can relax in that. God doesn't get up one day and be crabby. You're looking at the Old Testament. And the reason why he was so harsh in the Old Testament, let's get it again, is because the people didn't have God in them. The people were under the curse of flesh. So when they obeyed God, they got blessed. And when they disobeyed God, they got chastised heavily. Why? Here's why. How many know we needed Jesus? In the Old Testament, they didn't have Jesus, did they? He was still coming, right? So what if somebody decided to do something that kept Jesus from coming? Would we have any hope? None. If somebody stopped Jesus from being born, then we wouldn't have any hope. So when God dealt with people in the Old Testament, anyone that came against the plan of having Messiah be born were all treated as an enemy or a friend if they're on God's side. Now you take that kind of attitude and you bring it over in the New Testament, it's not going to work. Because God had to deal with man's flesh heavily in the Old Testament. 
and their attitude of not knowing they either had to have faith in God or they did their own thing. We know it got so bad and so corrupted that in Genesis it says that only eight people were untouched of corruption in the world. Now, where do we come off thinking that if we don't get in the Word, don't we don't start off in prayer, and we get out of those dumb religious churches that teach you Sunday school sermons? Be a nice person and go through these four steps. You ever heard that? Now, folks, I'm not on my bandwagon. I'm not against any church. I love anybody that preaches the gospel, amen. I don't care. But some of these churches, they're not giving out the gospel anymore. It's psychology. Do this, do this, and do this, and God will do this. How am I going to do that if I can't do that and can't do that? I tell you, you can't do that. Those lovely little points that you should be doing won't be able to do one of them without God helping you. And that's what they're leaving out. They're saying, take this, take this, take this, and do these steps. Yeah, but they're leaving out God helping us. You can't leave out the, the power to the furnace. No get warmy. <laughs> All right? So we forget, saves a master at pulling the power unit away from us and getting us to be religious in our practice. Hello? Religious people killed Jesus because he didn't match what they thought was right. You see, a religious person, we learned this, and oh, hey, come Wednesday nights, we're teaching the book of Romans. But, but we found out that religious people, all they can do is judge and compare. You're not like the first church. You better go home and get circumcised. Then you could be a real Christian. That's some of the stuff that we're teaching. And, and Paul called them a bunch of mutilators. All right, let's go right on through this. Catch this. Proverbs, listen to this, about being led and guided. Proverbs 16.9 says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. God wants you to have plans. He wants you to dream and all that. Amen? And, but he wants to be involved in those plans. Let him direct your steps to get there. Say Amen. Man's way leads away from God. Did you know your flesh has the nature of the devil in it? That's why you get old. That's why you get sick. That's why you have doubts. That's the nature in this. But that's not the, this is not the real us. The real us is our heart, which is our soul, and our spirit. That's the real you. You're going to get a new bod. In a moment, a twinkling of an eye, God's going to change your body. So don't invest all your time in it. One wise missionary said to me, he says, I feel like there's two of me. And I says, well, which one's winning? And he says, the one I feed the most. Flesh, my way, or God's way? Some say, oh, me. Amen. All right, so let's go on. God is so good. Don't you just love his word? Love sharing it, how the wisdom he gets, we get from it. Now, here we go. Listen to this. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man. But the end is the way of death. How many know we can't sing this song? I did it my way. <laughs> I love that. I, I, I pick out a little song once in a while, just kind of goop around the one. Feelings. Nothing more than feelings. You hurt my feelings. <laughs> So we got to laugh at each other because we're going to be heading for some serious stuff now, okay? I say, I'm with you, Pastor. All right, so listen to this. So there's a way that seems right to us, but we need to consult with God to get his way. Can you say amen? amen? Now, there's a real big temptation for us because we, some of us lived a long time, 66 years. I'm a youngster still. But all those past things, there were some good things in my past and some bad things in my past. There's a great temptation for some of us to take what we learned that we're good in our past and apply it in our present day situation. Don't do that. Because this is a day you've never passed through before with Jesus. You need his wisdom, not past things that worked for you. 
All I did before is just ignore it. It will go away. <laughs> Earthly wisdom. All right, so we got to point. You guys are so smart. You're so wonderful. I could stop right now. We could just celebrate and have church, but I got a couple more things to give you. Listen to this. Psalms 119, verse 133. This tells us, direct my steps, Lord, by your word. See, the word is a general step ordering, but the Spirit of God gives us the specifics. Hello. Don't step on the cat. Just around the corner there. Okay. <laughs> Couple of points. That's why God gave us his word, so we can have a general idea what is good and is acceptable and his perfect will of God is. Amen. When you're first saved, you find out everything is wonderful. And then you go about two or three months in, then you find out what happened. Now you're beginning to find out you got to grow in God. Diapers aren't going to make it when you're a three-year-old in, in uh, what is it, uh, kindergarten. Hello? And what's worse, when you got a 40-year-old man that's still wearing diapers, still getting upset over little things, you got to just have, you know, compassion on people like that. Don't interact. Somebody's just an irritant, and you bring them in, they're just irritated about everything. Don't engage the irritant. Just love. Because love is a drug to a person that's an irritant. Because the reason why usually we're irritable is because we don't feel love. So be a love pill to the irritated person. Can you say amen? Don't engage in an argument. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, getting in an argument just briefly will change the atmosphere of your house, of the room. So you, because you're wise and you have God on you, when somebody wants to tell you a thing or two, you just smile at them and don't engage what they say. Just simply love them. Now, did Jesus do something like that? You better believe that's how he dealt with it. The only time you see him angry is when the religious people started merchandising the gospel. Right, Alan? Man, he got the whip out. Snapped it a few times. All right. So God guides us by his word, but we need specific guidance. Say amen. The word is the fuel for a strong walk. Okay. It shows us the good and the acceptable will of God. Fourthly, the word, when we hear it and do it, it becomes a rock of the foundation of our feet. They cannot be moved. But you got to hear what it says and then you got to practice it. Doesn't mean you have to hit it right on. But if it says to love your enemies and you go, oh God, how am I going to do that? Here's how. Don't love them in your own strength. Amen. Let God love them through your heart. When Jesus says, turn the cheek, he was talking about when you guys get saved, when you turn the other cheek, God steps in. But if you're willing to fight right off the bat, you're going to lose. How many know that when people argue, nobody wins? And when people get in a fist of cups, everybody gets hurt. Satan's a master at messing with us. But see, you got the king of kings and lord of lords in your heart, and you need to tap the source. All right, moving right along. In order for us to be guided properly, we need to place God first in our heart. Everyone say God goes first. Now, I know we all agree with that. But do you actually put him first? Now, I'm not asking you to condemn yourself or, or to feel bad because we all slip up. What I'm trying to say is when we purposely choose to put God first, God gives us that grace to do that very thing and he puts a polish on us that makes us stand out. Hello? Because we're putting him first, not ourselves. And you look at the Heavenly Father and he looks down, we're going to use you, Denise, is that okay? He looks down at Denise and he says, she's putting my son first in her life. Lord, just bless the socks right off of her. You get it? 
Now, you might say, well, God's not a big Santa Claus. Well, no, silly. But who's the ones hurting? Is there a war in heaven? It's keeping God busy? My dad used to say, I don't want to bother God with the little things until he started and God started answering every one of them. This old way of thinking will limit your new way of living. God has to educate you what he gave you and it's going to take a little time for you to know what it is. I love knowing. First time God sent me out on a mission, I knew nothing. But I can tell you there was 15 direct divine miracles that happened to me on that little journey to go fight a forest fire in Colville. When I was a baby Christian, I was in six months old in the Lord. We had miracles. People got healed. Blind eye opened. People got rededicated to the Lord. And I was just a bumbling doof doof. Didn't know much what I was doing. But I simply obeyed God. Now I want to know that I'm not bragging. This is not anything that would do with bragging. God's just looking for somebody that wants to be his friend. And walk with him. All right, let's move on. So place God first. Listen to this. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all that you do, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Listen, trust in the Lord is different than having faith in God. Did you know? You see, when I first began to approach God, I approached him in faith. But after a while, when I learned to walk with him, now I trust him on everything. And I'm not trying to believe. No, I just trust. Trust is something that God builds in you through a period of relationship where you settle down and you trust the Lord. Daniel in the lion's den. King says, I'm sorry, you're going to be lion's food. And Daniel says, fear not, O king. God delivers me fine. If he doesn't choose to deliver me, I know God's handling it. And he pulled up a lion and went to sleep. What was that? He was trusting God. Why? God had worked with him all through the captivity and everything. Never let him down. God's never let you down either. So if somebody wants to toss you in the lion's den, you say, woo, this is going to be a good adventure. Thank you, Jesus. Is that the way you look at it? That's the way we should look at it. There isn't nothing in this earth going to keep you from your relationship with God unless you allow it. And frankly, you're just too caught up in God to let that happen. Say amen, somebody. Woo! Now I'm just getting fired up. Now look at this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own ability to reason things out, your own understanding. In your own ways, throughout the day, acknowledge God is there with you. Hey, God, I just whacked my hand with a thing, with a, and oh, Lord, is that something? Look at how crooked I made that. And you start talking to the Lord, exchanging all through the day. Why? He lives in you. He dwells with you. He's for you. And guess what? You're in him. How can you lose? Because Satan reasons with the unrenewed mind and tells you you're a loser. Shows you a few negative things. Oh, you get mad at your children today. (laughs) You see? And he starts this little... My sheep will hear my voice, and of a voice of a stranger, they will not follow. So let's get you used to God so well that if somebody speaks on behalf of God, but it doesn't line up with God, you can simply say, you're in error. And just kind of chuckle it and not worry about something like that. There's a whole bunch of prophets on the radio and all kinds of things telling you the United States is going to go through this and bombs are going to be flying and all that kind of stuff. Where do you think that confusion might come from? Well-meaning people trying to interpret things that they shouldn't on behalf of God and most of them are completely wrong. 
And if you put your faith in all that, you're going to get all that mixed up, jumble up. You might even move over to eastern Washington because you think a flood's going to wipe out western Washington. You see, silly, crazy, whacked out things that are not biblical nor guided by the Spirit. God wants to personally walk with you because you're a king and a queen in his eyes. Not because you did it your own. It's because you surrendered to him and he's making you that. The Bible says he's king of kings and he's lord of lords. So guess what? In the end, the millennial reign, no more Democrats, no more Republicans. Hello? It's going to be Jesus only reigning for a thousand years. And you and I are going to reign with him. So I'm not worried about what the Satan's going to do. Why aren't you concerned about this? And aren't you con well, yeah, I'm concerned, but guess what? I follow the captain of my salvation. I follow the one who's made my life worth living, and I thank God that he's never going to leave me alone. Amen. I don't have to ever worry about him leaving and forsaking me, no matter what I see with my eyes. Hey, folks, you're concerned about COVID? You have authority over it. Bind it up, cast it away. Yes. Doesn't mean you can run out and be stupid. But if you're going somewhere and you want freedom, you don't want to be concerned about it, ask the Lord in. He knows how to keep stuff off you. Yeah? My goodness. I think sometimes we face a crisis and we forget about some of the basic things. Next time you want to eat a plate of food at my house, use a fork and not your hands. <laughs> Why do you come up with things like that? Because in, in the flesh, we'd use our hands, but in the spirit, we'll do what's right. Can you say amen? All right. La almost done with you. All right. I like to try to keep it right about 1130 if we can, because some of the schedules is, is like, God, we're going to schedule you in today. No, Sundays, don't schedule nothing. On Saturday nights, don't go to late parties and stuff. No, you're going to sit in the presence of God, take communion, and you smell like a brewery. <laughs> People just don't. Come on now. You know what's scary about me? Is I have to share this stuff with you. Ooh, I want lots of friends. Hey, Amen. Let's go on. You don't see the humor in that. I'm, God help you. All right. So, catch this. So, we learn to trust in the Lord. We don't lean to our own understanding. We need God's understanding. Can you say amen? Thirdly, in all our ways, we're to acknowledge him. Interact with the Lord is what it's saying. Interact. Hey, God, good morning. You're interacting. Hey, Lord, come sit with me for breakfast. Today I had breakfast with the Lord. Amen. Little two-ounce steak, two eggs, and a, a, a jelly toast. And God and I ate it. You go, oh, that's so, that's so, so funny. Hey. God loves me. That's right. He considers me yeah. worth enough for him to come live in me. Amen. You too. Amen. Treat him that way. Yeah. Stop walking around like you're a separate individual. Have I made you think today? Yeah. This sermon came directly from God. I don't think these things up. I said, God, what do you want me to teach the congregation? And he starts laying it out. I said, you sure you don't want me to talk about something else? <laughs> of course not. All right, so let's go on. So finally, if we acknowledge him throughout the day, then we're in a position where God says, today, don't take that path to the store. Take this path. Okay. See, specifics. Don't take your car, take your truck. Why would I take my truck, Lord? Because we're going to pick up a great big, huge baptism. You see, you never know. You start making these choices for God, and we might miss some of the wonderful things he wants to add to us. So what I'm trying to say is everything God involves with you is always going to benefit you and always build you up. So if he asks you to do something that's a little different, it's, Lord, that doesn't make quite sense. Well, he can see beyond what you can see, and he might know that it will make sense. And then when it happens, you go, I'm glad I brought the truck. 
We want those things to happen to us all the time. How many here want those things to happen? Then in the morning when you pray, say, God, it's an adventure. Please, let's be on an adventure together. Open my eyes, show me things, and let me become obedient to you. I need your help, God. Thank you in Jesus' name. Right? Go with me to John, please. The Holy Spirit gives us the what, the when, and the where of our daily life. John 16, please, verses 12 through 15. Read along with me. I don't think a 10, 15-minute sermon is really going to punch you up when you go into some of these churches that give you a really good, powerful sermon for 20 minutes. They collect your money, pat you on the back, send you out, you're going to conquer the world. No, you need answers. All right, John 16, look at verse 12. I still have many things, Jesus is talking, many things to say to you disciples, but you cannot bear them now. However, when the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth has come, he will, now listen, this is the Spirit's job, guide you into all truth. So when you say, Father, I need to know more about your love, sit down and let the Holy Spirit take you in and show you love. He'll walk you through your day showing you what love can do. That's how he does it. Lord, I don't want to get angry so easily anymore. The Holy Spirit will then sit down in the Lord, and, and I don't mean literally physically sit down, because he might ask you to get up and walk somewhere, <laughs> but you're sitting down as a rest and letting God take the forefront, take the lead. And then he, the Holy Spirit guides you into that truth of the word and rubs it in you in such a way it becomes a part of your life. That's what the Holy Spirit's for. That's why Satan doesn't want you to move in the spirit. Oh, you got to watch out for that stuff. Sure you do. It'll make you a champion. Let's go on. Listen, listen. He will guide you into all truth. However, when the spirit of God comes, he will guide you into all truth and he will not speak on his own authority. I, the Holy Spirit, saith No. But whatever he hears from God, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. The Holy Spirit's job is to show you what's in tomorrow. Hello? Not the prophet down the street. The Holy Spirit's job is to show you what's involved in the rest of your day and what your day tomorrow is. And sufficient in the day is... The evil thereof. So let the Lord show you what he has for you in that day and ignore the rest. Can you say amen? Because many things that the enemy does, listen to me carefully, are distractions. Isn't it amazing when the pastor's about ready to say something, a baby cries and everybody turns their head? Hello? And so we don't want a creature, we don't want to be that type of person that walks from our outside in. That's what we did when we were sinners. We walked by what we tasted, touched, smelled. If it feels good, do it. You know? But as a Christian, we walk from the inside out. God outwardly. Can you say amen? Hope you got that. All right, so let's go on with this. The Holy Spirit guides us in all truth. Now listen to the rest of this. He will glorify Jesus Christ, for he will take what is mine and declare it unto you. The word declare means that God will com completely repeat it till you get it. What did he do to Peter? Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. You know, his first answer. And he says, Peter, feed my sheep. And he says, Peter, do you really love me? Oh, Lord, you know, I love you. He's just making excuses. That's why when God asked him the third time, he got upset. He says, Peter, are you kidding me? You're here fishing and you're doing your own thing. Do you really love me? He got angry. Yes, Lord, I love you. And he says, feed my lambs. Why do we get angry? 
because we're too much in control. Moving right on. <laughs> okay. So you guys still love me? Stretch your hands forward and ask God to bless me. Okay. All right. So my next, last, finally, second to last point. Ask God about everything. Look at your neighbor and say, ask God about everything. Ask God about everything. You going to buy a new car? Going to marry a husband? You better ask God. Husband, you going to marry a wife? You going to invest in Bitcoin? You probably don't even know what that is. Ask God. That's a, a, a coin. It's all elect, electronic. There's no money back, and then it's all a gamble. God told me this. I'm going to share it with you. How many's ever been to Vegas? How about Reno? Any of those places? And when you go, you usually, not always, I didn't. My wife, we went just because we've never gone. We went and we took our granddaughter and we played on all of the circus toys and all that. And we had a great time. We didn't go in and gamble. We ate the food and played with the toys. But it's pretty boring if you don't gamble, okay? I asked the Lord, Lord, what kind of an example that I can give as a pastor to explain the world system, the system of the world, and God told me, he says, you ever played cards and gambled? You ever, you ever played the, you know, one-armed bandit? It, it, they go on, what, luck? You're going to win some, and you're going to what? That's the world system. You launch out, you haven't got God guiding you, and you win some? And Satan says, yeah, I'll show you how to do that more. And he leads you down the proverbial path. And, or he says... You're going to lose something. And people end up committing suicide because all their hope is on themselves and on what life brings them. And they forgot there was a living God. That's why God wants you and I sharing our faith with others and learning how to lead somebody through the, uh, to the new birth experience through the sinner's prayer, prayer of salvation. If you don't know how to do that, you're missing out one of the most primary things you need to know. Philippians 4, everyone say, I got it. 6 through 7. Now, if you're going to do something, before you do it, pray. Right? I had a guy, wonderful guy. I had a person come in, and, and they stayed here for a little over a year. They stole us blind. They stole $1,000 of our equipment, all that. This is a military family, and they just literally tore this place up. And that's where I met some of you in this shambles of what we had left. And the sad thing about those kind of things is, is, is that you, it puts you in an I, I couldn't sleep at nights. So I had to stay up and make sure these people weren't ripping me blind. Cops, people in the back would call me and, and say, hey, you're whatever this guy is, hopping the fence and bringing girls in the back. And, and I'm going, oh, God, help me. Of course, none of us has ever suffered any of those things. <laughs> you know what I mean? Your church, you're dealing with people. Well, God begins to show you what to yield to and whatnot. If I, I should have prayed and said, God, should I really open my heart to this couple? Oh, they looked apart. Three beautiful, cutest kids, a darling little wife, and a soldier on crack and methamphetamine. And it ripped me off blind, stole equipment, shut everything down. Of course, don't worry about that. But the Bible says in Timothy, take the spoiling of your goods with joy. What are you going to do with that scripture? <laughs> I did. I turned it all over to God. Guitars. We had guitar and everything. And I said, Lord, we're going to make it a gift. And you know what? He's starting giving us all that back. You see, you can get all upset about it and then enter into the mess. Or you can be led by the Lord, and I should have prayed about it. And I know we could all go back in, in the areas of our life and say, man, I can remember that time. I just should have prayed about it. But we can't change that. But listen to what it says. Be anxious for nothing. Say, don't worry about a thing. Don't you worry about a thing. Right? So be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. 
with supplication, that word there simply, with petitioning. Lord, your word says... Lord, the prophet, your, your word says that, Lord. Lord, look what your word says. That's petitioning. Do you take your Bible in in prayer? Or maybe a pocket prom, promise Bible and, and begin to read out the promises God promised you? And remind him. God says, you have not because you what? Ask not. Mm. Ooh. Philippians 4 says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer, supplication, with being thankful, let your request be made known to God. Then the peace that passes understanding will guard your hearts and minds. Hearts and minds. Amen. Through Christ Jesus. Now then it says, this is really important. Whatever is good, whatever is pure, Whatever is perfect, whatever is just, whatever is holy, what brings good reports? Think about those things. Folks, here's something. How many's ever heard a bad report and passed it on to somebody? Like Carmen died. You know, he died of cancer. And I miss him already, right? When we share something like that, we have to be careful how we share. Can you say amen? Yeah. Because it could be in a negative fashion. All right, we don't want to do that. Finally, learn to live and walk in the Spirit. Everyone say, learn to live, learn to live. And, walk in the spirit. and walk in the Spirit. Okay, folks, it's not as hard as it sounds. To walk in the Spirit means to be innocent like a child. The only way you can do that is you get up in the morning and you address God and you spend a little time with God. When you do that, the inner man rises up to the occasion while the outer man, the flesh, that causes us problem, shuts down. God quiets our mind, encourages our spirit, and he says, now, when you leave here, you'll be walking in the spirit realm. Satan can't touch you. Think about it. Can Satan go into the throne room anytime he wants? He was thrown out. Can Satan go into your prayer closet anytime he wants? No, God won't let him. But why is it we pray privately and then we brag publicly of what we prayed about? That's how Satan catches wind. You're praying about your kids? Be quiet about it. Get people that can really pray with you about it. And then every time the, the children are mentioned, say, thank God they're on their way. Amen. Thank God they're on their way. And don't get in long conversations that something you already prayed about and that you are undoing what you prayed about. Through a conversation of a lack of wisdom. Why continually talk the problem if you gave it to God? People for healing, I tell them. They say, I say, do you want to be healed? And they say, I certainly hope so. I says, you can't get healed then. Because you're hoping to be healed. Go home, study some scriptures on healing. Come back and let's get you healed. See the difference? So... I just want to let you know, my pastor was so gracious with me and 30 others like me. And every one of them are still in the ministry today, very successful. Because he took the time to give us what we needed, not just religious teaching. Say amen. amen. So here's a couple points I want you to realize. If we trust the Lord, we need to always, anything that causes us a little worry, cast it over on the Lord as quick as you can. It's yours, Lord. Don't hold on to it. Say amen. If we don't seek God and his wisdom, we're liable to act on what we know. And it might not be enough. Say amen. Come on. And then thirdly, remember, we have not because we ask not. God wants you to bug him till he can't sleep. He never does anyway. You got a long list of need? Don't pick the four favorite ones and say, well, I won't bother God with the rest. Just go down the list and say, God, I need help. Then believe you received it. Put the list off somewhere and don't keep praying for the same things over and over again. Like, for example, the Bible says, ask and keep on asking. So if you ask for a shield and the shield shows up, you don't ask for a shield. You ask for something more. 
So the ask and keep on asking and you shall receive and keep on receiving means that you keep advancing your asking because you have such great need. You are not perfect. God is. Ask, 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 ask. Help, 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 help until you are finally so flooded. You can be like Moses and say, God, turn it off. No. <laughs> and you think about that. Your head right there when I did that your head's gone. Yeah, you don't want to bother God. It just starts making the excuses. Let me tell you something about your head. How many's ever heard your voice talk to you? How many's ever heard your voice? And if, if you ever hear your voice talk to you in a negative fashion, listen, it's not your voice, it's Satan using it in your head. That's what happened when Adam and Eve had their eyes open when they ate of the tree. Satan can now suggest things in the minds of human beings. Look at Cain killing his brother. So if you got a bird flying over your head named Lucifer, you don't want him pooping in your head. So you don't want to entertain any thought, whether it's your voice or not, that says anything that's anti-gospel. Oh, you'll never amount to anything. You're always failing at that. You ever heard your voice say something like that? That's not you. That's Satan using your voice. Tell him to shut up. In Jesus' name, Satan, shut up. Now, you can do it a lot less than that, but I'm amidst people who probably agree with me 100%. Now, listen. Galatians 5, verse 16 through 18 says, This I say, walk in the spirit, or walk from the inside out, and you will not fulfill the little crabby nastiness of your desiring or your flesh. For the flesh goes against the spirit, and the spirit wants to serve God and goes against the flesh. These are contrary, so that you cannot do the things you want. But if you are led by the spirit. So, folks, don't walk with God by licking your finger and putting it in the air and say, God, where do you want me to go today? <laughs> to prayer. <laughs> All right. And then the last part of that says, if you walk in the Spirit, also live by the Spirit. And we can. It's just so strange. Because people don't teach this much anymore. But guess what? You're going to get it here. My pastor taught us how to listen to his voice, how to get things done on the specifics of when, when, and where to do it. Can you say amen? He loves you that much to give you specifics. Ask him. You all remember what Romans 8 says, don't you? It says, therefore, brethren, we're not debtors to our flesh to live according to what our flesh desires. For if you live according to the flesh, you will separate from God and die. But if you put to death your flesh in Christ, you shall live. For to be carnally minded is death. In other words, to let your mind run rampant with negative thoughts, will separate you from being close to God. Yeah. How many ever had your heart wanted to do something, but your head talked you out of it? Yeah. So you need to understand about yourself. So don't you miss next Sunday. Because next Sunday, I'm going to show you how to steer your way into success with God biblically. I'm going to cut it off right there. If you got something out of that, will you give the Lord a hand clap?